This week on Empowering Midlife Wellness, we're celebrating Menopause Awareness Month. And there's so much more awareness in the population about menopause, however, not enough amongst physicians. So I'll be sharing a little bit today how you can help your provider to be more aware of menopause, how you can find a menopause provider yourself, and how as a tribe of women in menopause or perimenopause, we can help to spread the word through education, educating ourselves, our friends, and our providers, and how to find someone who can take care of you. Hi friends, and welcome to this week's episode. If you're just joining me, I'm Dr. Susan. I'm a board certified gynecologist and certified menopause practitioner dedicated 100% to taking care of women in perimenopause, menopause, and beyond. And did you know that this month is Menopause Awareness Month? We actually get one special day on October 18th, which is World Menopause Day, so we're looking forward to that. But I'm so excited that there's so much more discussion about this really important topic. 51% of people in the world live a good portion of their lives, perhaps up to half of it nowadays in menopause. And so we're finally starting to talk about it, but we're far from aware enough. And I want to talk about a couple of things that you can do to help. Here's a sad statistic. Today, only 4% of women in the United States are taking menopausal hormone therapy, those that would be eligible for it. And if you go to the doctor, this was as of 2023, with symptoms of menopause, you are much more likely to be offered an antidepressant than to be offered menopausal hormone therapy. And the reason for that, no judgment, is that most physicians are still not aware of menopause, even as a topic, nor of the possible treatment options, lifestyle changes, and things that we can do to help you to feel better. So one thing you can do as a patient is help to empower yourself by educating your providers. And I'm going to include a couple of papers here below, which I personally believe are two really helpful reviews that have come out in the past year. I can tell you there's so much research on menopause that as a menopause specialist, I spend you know, three to four hours a day on trying to keep up with it and filter it out. So we can't possibly expect the average physician to do that, but sometimes a really good review article can be a really great place to start. And in the back of these review articles are numerous references that anybody could go to if they wanted to dig further. So a couple of them I'm going to put here for you to download and share with your friends and read and then share with your physician. So if you go to a doctor and feel dismissed or not understood, or certainly if you hear that hormone replacement or menopausal hormone therapy is dangerous or that you shouldn't take it because of any reason other than the few that are legitimate, and I'll tell you about those in a moment, then you can ask some more questions based on science. We don't have to be aggressive. We don't have to be confrontational. We're just simply trying to help spread the message and educate. So menopause awareness means that physicians and healthcare providers first need to be aware of this, and hopefully soon we'll be teaching it at medical school and residency, but in the meantime, Those of us in our age group need to be empowered to ask those questions ourselves. So in these papers that I put below, you will see, and some of them I mentioned before, that the consensus amongst educated gynecologists who are trained in menopausal hormone therapy is that, with very few exceptions, menopausal hormone therapy is safe for almost everybody. The exceptions are very few, and those would be if you currently are being treated for an estrogen-sensitive cancer, that would primarily be breast or uterine cancer, if you have severe liver disease, or if you've personally had a history of a blood clotting event. And there's a caveat to that because not all of those count. For example, if you had a blood clot in your leg because you had a broken leg, broken hip, you were in the hospital immobilized, or if it was after surgery, or there was some particular reason for it, that doesn't necessarily count. We're talking about blood clots that might indicate that you have some type of underlying predisposition to blood clotting. 
And even then there's a little caveat because truly that really only applies to taking estrogen by mouth because that increases the risk of blood clotting. At this point, using transdermal estrogen, we think has little or minimal effect on blood clotting. So that's even a little bit of a gray area, but if you read the official statement, uh, history of blood clot would be a contraindication to taking at least estrogen. However, in all those cases, even if it says that hormone replacement is not for you, I'll add another one, having undiagnosed bleeding. Of course, we want to make sure you don't have uterine cancer, as I mentioned, before you start hormone replacement. Even if you have one of those things, it doesn't mean you can't take any hormone replacement. That's specifically talking about taking estrogen. So really, very, very few people cannot take any hormone replacement at all. Uh, possibly some shouldn't take estrogen, at least for a short time. But when you read in these papers, uh, the very exciting things is there is some opening up now to understanding, yes, not only is it safe for almost everybody, it provides benefit for many things, including primarily a massive reduction in heart disease, which most of you have heard about so many times now. It sounds like a broken record. Reduction in diabetes, reduction in osteoporosis and related fractures, which lead to death in so many of us in our older years, probably reduction in neurologic decline. There's a lot more science on ongoing there, reduction in colon cancer without an increase in death from breast cancer, which has just got to be stopped talking about. So now we know all of those things, and you'll also see in these papers, there's some opening up around understanding that testosterone is very important for women. There are numerous studies that have been done on testosterone and placebo, and undoubtedly testosterone given in patients who have low testosterone, which is almost everybody around the time of menopause, helps with what's called hypoactive sexual desire disorder, HSDD, also known as low libido. So testosterone has been studied for low libido. However, as a side point, it's also been noticed to improve muscle mass and bone density. So off-label, using testosterone for those things is something that many of us do. Now, when you read these academic articles, they're very careful to stick within the realm of what academic societies have stated. For example, academic societies have stated that menopausal hormone therapy should be used for hot flashes and night sweats, what we call genitourinary syndrome, which is vaginal dryness, pain with intercourse, related bladder problems, and also for osteoporosis prevention. So we've got as far as saying that it's okay to recommend it for those things. Curiously, even though we know from multiple studies, including the Women's Health Initiative study and several subsequent studies, many previous studies, that heart disease risk is dramatically reduced in women who start on estrogen in the first 10 years after menopause, so timing's important. Still, there's no official position saying that taking menopausal hormone therapy is useful for prevention of heart disease. This is just one of the frustrating things in academic medicine. It takes years to turn these barges, which are these academic institutions, to, to come up with a position statement. So on one hand, they state, and these organizations are great, and I'm not criticizing them, but on one hand, they state, yes, there's a very clear understanding that taking estrogen in the first few years after menopause dramatically reduces the risk of heart disease. However, there's no official position statement saying that estrogen should be used as a primary prevention for heart disease, which kind of doesn't make sense, especially since they say that it absolutely should be used as a primary prevention for heart disease in women who go through early menopause. So we're getting there. Yeah, it's great for primary prevention for heart disease in women who go through early menopause, and we absolutely should do that. But for women who go through menopause at the normal time, even though we know it reduces the risk of heart disease dramatically, we're not quite allowed to say that yet. And this, this is simply an understanding of the way these big academic institutions work. They have to go through multiple layers of committees and reviews and et cetera before they come up with a position statement. Now, the, the North American Menopause Society, now known as the Menopause Society, has changed its position multiple times, as it should. We should learn and grow. And as these position statements change, they become more inclusive of these findings. So 
When you look at these two articles, you'll see some relaxation around those things I mentioned, like testosterone and, yes, cardiovascular disease is reduced, etc. Also, even suggesting that in some cases, taking estrogen after a diagnosis of breast cancer, which has been treated, is not a capital N-O, no. Just loosening up around these ideas that used to be so black and white. So we're becoming much more aware Again, back to the Menopause Awareness Month, awareness of, yeah, let's look at this bigger picture and understand it a little bit more with some more nuance. And again, if you're listening to this, you very likely know more than your primary care physician. So rather than being in that 96% of women who are not offered hormone therapy, because there's still this belief that in some way that it's dangerous or there's a lack of understanding and instead you're being offered an antidepressant, you could give this information and help to educate your doctor. So that is my first point. Now, secondly, where do you find a menopause provider? If you're frustrated because your provider is just not giving you the help that you need, how do you find somebody who can actually help you? Well, lots of ways. Um, The Menopause Society menopause.org has a list of providers who have had some training in the subject of menopause. Now, I've mentioned this before. I do want you to be careful to understand that to be a member of the Menopause Society, you just have to write a check. It doesn't require any proof of education. But to be listed as a menopause practitioner, you actually do have to take a test. Now, anyone could take a test, right? But at least it suggests that that person has enough interest to have read a book and paid some money to take an exam. So anyone who's listed as a Menopause Society practitioner on the menopause.org website, you can, you know, understand has a real interest in menopause and probably is quite educated. So that's a great resource. Now, another great resource, my friend and many of you know, Dr. Mary Claire Haver, who has a magnificent microphone right now in the field of menopause, since she's got millions of followers on her various platforms. On her website, The Pause Life, she has a very extensive list of providers that have been recommended by her followers. So I do like that list. I'm proud to be on it, along with my partner, Dr. Leah. So that's a good resource because those doctors or providers have been recommended by other people who've actually seen them and said, yes, this is somebody that I would recommend my friend or sister seeing. And so that's a good resource as well. So those are some places that you can go in the meantime while you're educating your own physician to be more aware about the whole process of menopause. So number one, educate yourself. Number two, help educate your physicians. And number three, find a provider who really wants to help you. Now, let's talk about that a little bit more because my practice sees patients specifically for this, and I understand it's not something that's available to everybody. Unfortunately, in the current environment with insurance, doctors are paid to see patients for about 15 minutes. And I retired from that in 2020 because I realized I could not serve my patients in 15 minutes, and it was incredibly frustrating not only to me, but my patients, because we just couldn't get anywhere near the bottom of what was going on with menopause in that short time. So when you come to see me or one of my providers in the office, our first visit is 90 minutes long. We allow 90 minutes of time, including time for you to get checked in and seen. So at least 60 minutes of that is eye to eye with your provider talking only about you. And we have a battery of labs. We've got your body composition. We order all the necessary uh, preventative screenings. We offer things like VO2 max and DEXA scanning for body composition. We do basic body composition in our office. We talk about weight optimization. We talk about nutrition. We talk about movement slash exercise, including resistance training. We talk about mindset. We talk about the psychology of menopause, all of it, rest, sleep, stress management. I don't think it's enough just to be prescribed an estrogen patch and progesterone by mouth because you deserve all of that other 
help as well because we're a holistic human being. So if you have the opportunity to come see me or one of my providers in our office or virtually, that is something that I'm offering. And I want to give you a preview of a new service that we're introducing. If you're interested in this, I'll put a website below where you can email the appropriate person to show that you might have interest in this because we'll be uh, launching this in January. There will be a program where you can see me or one of my providers for two 90-minute visits one-on-one going through absolutely everything to teach you everything that you need to know about menopause along with a series of videos, opportunities to meet with our group, the group of women who are being seen in this manner once a week on Zoom so you can talk, ask Q&A, have some really direct interactions. We'll have an online women's circle that you can join through this program. Yes, it's expensive and it's not for everybody because it is three hours of provider time directly focused on you. And that might not be available for everyone, but if if it is, patients who are in California, where I'm now licensed, and Texas, would be able to get the full scope of medical care, including getting prescriptions. But patients anywhere else in the world can still see us through what's called our coaching and education platform. So we can see you on a video platform, and discuss everything from an educational point of view without practicing medicine. So we cannot prescribe medicine, but we can suggest which ones you might be optimally advised to take. And you can take that information to your provider or even to one of the fabulous online medical services that are now serving menopausal women like Alloy.com and others. Now, I personally don't think that's Everything that you need, but if you can go online and get a prescription for an estrogen patch and some progesterone, that's going to get you a long way. Now, is it everything? No, but we don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. If you can get that and that's all you can get, then by all means, go get it. So these online platforms are fabulous. And are they everything? No, but they're a fantastic start. So you could do one of the online programs and get your estrogen patch and progesterone as long as you don't have any of those contraindications. They would ask you about those, of course. That's great. That's relatively inexpensive. Anyone can do that. Or you could go all the way into seeing me for three hours eye to eye on a video screen, followed by weekly Zoom visits, weekly women's circles, and that's going to be available as well. So in case you're interested in that program, we're going to put a specific email to that below so that you can show some interest and be first on the list because it will be a very limited program. Again, we're going to be launching that in January. And then if you happen to be a provider and you're interested in learning how to start a menopause practice or how to serve your patients better in the realm of menopause, we'll also be introducing a learning platform for providers because goodness knows one of the biggest gaps in menopause awareness is in provider awareness. So that's all going to be launched in January. If you are a provider or if you know a provider who's interested in learning more about how to help their menopausal patients and perimenopausal patients, we'll put an email below so that you can be first on the list to be invited to that program too when it's launched. So very exciting, Menopause Awareness Month. We've got lots of things going on. We're going to help provide more awareness for our providers. You can do that too by sharing these two papers below. We can do that through our platform we're announcing and launching in January. You yourself can get help. Find a provider through menopause.org, through the Pause Life, Mary Claire Haver's wonderful site, or come and see us. Uh, We are seeing patients virtually and anywhere in the world and also in person in two locations in Houston, and we'd love to see you. So happy Menopause Awareness Month. We'll be talking a little bit more on Menopause Day, which is October 18th. Very exciting. We get one day all to ourselves. And if you learned something today, please don't forget to subscribe, share it with your friends, and I can't wait to see you next week. Mm -hmm.